Welcome everyone to Proto Talks and our first forum of the year. I'm your host, Matt Morgan. I'm one of the founders of Protogetic, the security industry's first digital marketplace. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors, Ameristar Perimeter Security, Amico Security Doors and Windows, and Clear Armor Security Glass and Protective Coatings. All our leading product manufacturers within the industry and all of their data and information can be found on protogetic.com. We hope you enjoy today's approximately 60 minute discussion about the dangerous rise and mobilization of domestic militant groups here in the United States. Now, during the conversation, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat down below. We will try and get to them during the Q&A. Now, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. David Gartenstein Ross, a counterterrorism analyst and CEO of Valens Global. Valens Global is a counterterrorism company that consults on Al Qaeda, ISIS, ISIL, and other militant insurgent groups. Dr. Gartenstein Ross is also the senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies and the author of a book, Bin Laden's Legacy, Why We're Still Losing the War on Terror. Dr. Gartenstein Ross, welcome to Proto Talks. Thank you, Matt. It's uh, really an honor and a pleasure to be here and to be the, the keynote speaker of the very first in the Proto Talks series. Thanks everyone for joining us. So we're going to talk about what happened at the Capitol and its broader meaning. And obviously, the perspective we have here relates um, in large part to building security. Uh, so as, as, as I was first talking about this presentation with Matt, uh, we had a conversation about um, you know, uh, what he called militia readiness and the state of domestic actors. What I wanna do here is make an argument because what Matt and I went back and forth about is to what extent do the actors matter versus to what extent is it something else? I'm gonna argue that what's going on is something else. Actors are relevant, but that the key factor which has changed in the US and globally is the information environment which gives rise to a speed of mobilization that is unprecedented. And that has many layers of meaning, but in particular, when you're thinking about the built environment and how it relates to a problem set, very similar to the problem set of January the 6th, we're going to have to look at it through an environmental lens that's much broader than simply a set of actors. So in this presentation, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about what has changed. Then we're going to zoom out and look at the phenomenon of computer mediated communication. We're going to look specifically at social media and um, one thing that is a current research fascination of mine, the dopamine feedback loop. We're going to look at examples of rapid mobilization enabled by the information environment. We'll do a case study looking at a group called the Adam Watham Division. It's a neo-Nazi organization that in many ways exemplifies the new information environment that we're in. We're gonna talk about mass shootings as well. When you're looking at this from the perspective of building security and an information environment that is allowing different threat vectors, mass shooters are most definitely a part of that. And then finally, we'll turn briefly to the capital attack from a tactical perspective. So as I said, my argument is that a key thing that has changed is the information environment. There's a couple of pictures here to the left. You probably recognize one of them. You probably don't recognize the other. The top left picture is Tunisia circa 2011. You all certainly remember a decade ago that you had a series of revolutions in the Middle East and North Africa region. It was known at the time as the Arab Spring. And people did pay attention to social media induced mobilizations at the time, but I think did not fully understand the implications of them. I remember being immersed in debates and there was a consensus view at the time that quickly emerged 
that these events, the regional revolutions would be devastating to militant organizations like Al-Qaeda. Uh, there's a fairly infamous February 2011 article um, as uh, regions governments topple, Al-Qaeda watches history fly by. It was published by, in the New York Times, uh, written by Scott Shane. Um, and to me, this quickly emerging consensus that militant groups were going to be sidelined by the revolutions was missing of something. When we get swept up in a moment, we can root for a set of actors. And there's no way that the democratic actors who are toppling governments from Tunisia to Egypt and challenging Libya and challenging Syria's government, there's no way that those actors were unsympathetic. But we can lose sight of how other actors, less sympathetic actors, more nefarious actors, may take advantage of the situation. So at the time, you know, I argued that we were we were very short-sighted in seeing the region's revolutions as being an end to the terrorist threat. And obviously, within three years, you had ISIS declare its caliphate stretching from Syria into Iraq. And suddenly terrorism was at the back at the, at the top of the news again for years to come. The bottom left is South Africa in 2015. And this is interesting to me because I was traveling through South Africa to Namibia at the time. What these protests were against is a rise in university fees. Um, I'd already been paying attention to social media induced mobilizations. And um, in Namibia, this African Union sponsored um, conference that I was at, I was able to spend some time with this old anti-apartheid activist from South Africa. And what he told me then has stuck with me. He said, there's just no comparison between this and the apartheid era. When we were combating apartheid, we'd have to organize house to house, block to block and have pamphlets and make sure that the authorities couldn't see where we were going to organize. And now someone throws a hashtag up on Twitter and suddenly tens of thousands are out on the streets. It's a very different pace of mobilization. And what I'm going to show you is that the capital attack should be understood within the change of pace of mobilization and that that has broader implications. So going back, um, computer mediated communication, um, I, I, um, it was something that's been of interest uh, for me since my college days. I, I majored in communication. And, um, you know, back when I was in college, I graduated in 1999. The United States was not fully online yet. Even when you got to, to, to by, by 2000, less than 50% of Americans were online. Now that number is, is well over 90%. But looking at some of the communication theories that I studied back in my college days, they had a surprising amount of explanatory power. I say surprising because as a social scientist, I sometimes have low regard for social science, but I think that these are um, academic works that have not only stood the test of time, but going back and looking at changes in people's psyche at the time can really help to explain some of what we are seeing now. So there are three different theories, which when it comes to extremist groups, whether it's those within the uh, Islamist militant ecosystem like Al-Qaeda or ISIS, or those within the white supremacist extremist ecosystem, um, such as Adam Waffen or the base. When looking at any of them, there are three theories that I think are, are highly helpful. All of them relate to the online space. One is identity demarginalization. And what this holds is that the online space eliminates social and geographic boundaries for concealable and culturally devalued identities. To unpack that term a bit, there are some identities that may be culturally devalued. Um, you know, for example, there may be discrimination that different ethnic minority groups confront, but they're not concealable. Someone can look at you and understand that you're a member of a minority group, can understand that you have a visible disability, can understand that you're overweight or what, whatever other factor there is. Then there are other identities that are culturally devalued 
but also concealable. Being a white nationalist is not something that people will cop to in polite society. Being a supporter of ISIS, um, there are multiple other culturally devalued identities. In the 1990s, when I was in college, LGBT identity was culturally devalued and someone couldn't tell by looking at you that you were gay. You've had obviously a revolution in LGBT identity since then with the Supreme Court holding that um, uh, marriage by LGBT groups is constitutionally required. And um, with a growing acceptance, obviously LGBT identities still experience discrimination, but we have a world of difference um, in a relatively quick period with respect to how that identity is perceived. I mentioned LGBT identity because that was one of the sets of studies at the time. You know, they were looking at, they looked at white nationalism at the time. They looked at LGBT identities. They looked at pro-anorexic groups. And in every case found that people who might not take their concealable and culturally devalued identity and make it a part of their public persona were very willing to do so online. And in fact, online communities would coalesce around these identities. Later on, when ISIS emerged as this global phenomenon in 2014 to 2016, I would turn back to identity demarginalization. And something that was very clear is that if you supported a group like ISIS, circa you know, 1995, you might have never come across, and you lived in say Des Moines, Iowa, you might never come across somebody else who believes as you do. But by 2015, uh, 2014, you could hop onto Twitter and within 10 minutes, you could, you could chat with a pro-ISIS fighter in Raqqa. We've seen something very similar in both the anti-government extremist space and also the white supremacist extremist space. We'll talk about those when we talk about the Capitol attack. A second um, form of computer mediated communication that is highly relevant to what we've seen since then has been group polarization, that groups that interact online can become more radicalized, more um, entrenched in their beliefs and more um, antithetically opposed to groups that believe differently through mutual reinforcements. And then another theory, the social identity model of de-individuating effects found that immersion and anonymity within a group can result in less individual self-awareness and also more salience with group identity and norms. So this speaks to how people through the online space can become more rapidly indoctrinated or immersed in extremist groups than before. And I think this is not just relevant to extremist groups. It's also relevant to where we are as a society because ultimately the capital attack cannot be divorced from current polarization and tribalization of American society. All of that is reinforced by the way that we use the online space. Whether or not the polarizing and tribalizing impact of the online space will reverse is something that only time will tell. It'll ultimately be up to all of us. But right now that is the direction where it's heading in. Greater polarization, greater animosity across varieties of identity groups and belief groups, and greater salience of extremist groups, extremist organizations. Um, so the other thing is we don't just have more computer mediated communication, which obviously is um, facilitated by the internet, but also we have more use of social media in particular. The transition from web 1.0 to web 2.0 to ultimately the social web is highly significant. Web 1.0, uh, those of you who you started using the web in the 1990s will be familiar with this. It's the, the read only web. Someone would have their website, you look at their website, it might be interesting to you, it might not be, you might email them. Web 2.0 is the read-write web. It's where user-generated content started to become more significant. Blogs are a good example of Web 2.0. Blogs were, um, you know, and are interactive, um, but ultimately their focus is on the, what, what's published in the news, what's going on in the world. By the time you reach the social web, the content really is you. The focus is on the user. The user has become the content. 
So when we turn to social media and what has changed in a social media environment, it has not just an impact in the way that we communicate and an impact on the way that we're able to mobilize, it also has a chemical impact on our brains. Um, companies like Facebook now have executives who've um, talked somewhat openly about the way the platform will hijack our dopamine. You have companies um, that are exclusively devoted to understanding the dopamine effect and trying to monetize it in some way or another. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that has a reward function. Um, if you do something that is positive, um, you know, eating, exercising, these can trigger a dopamine response. It's a reward function um, and it's felt chemically. Social media algorithms are engineered specifically to have addictive, addictive qualities to trigger the dopamine effect. The brain gets conditioned to seek more reward, to seek likes, to seek comments, followers, shares, basically social stimuli. And the result is that we're not just drawn to social media by pure interest. As we have become the content sharers, our brain chemicals expect a response. Now, I don't wanna take this too far. Um, there's some current research that uh, suggests that um, extremism can be understood in part as a chemical reaction. I have some skepticism about this, but I will say that, that despite my skepticism of some of the ways that current research is, directionism of current research, it's very clear that the mediums we use day to day seem addictive because they are addictive. And that fundamentally has another impact on the information environment. It has an impact on people's proclivity to get sucked into dark corners of the web, seemingly to deepen their involvement. It has an impact, though we shouldn't overstate what it is, on the prevalence of extremism. So when we turn to 2020, we had four different mobilizations that year. And let me be very clear what I say, what I mean by mobilization. A mobilization is not necessarily bad. It can be good. Um, you know, mobilization simply means that people mobilize um, in order to um, you know, protest um, or to do something else. Uh, many of the mobilizations I'm focusing on here are protest mobilizations. But what I'd like to do is take a step back from the actors and the causes and focus on the tactics. Um, there's a very good book uh, written by uh, a scholar of terrorism, Yannick Villeneuve Lepage. The book is called How Terror Evolves, and it looks at airline hijackings. And what it does that's very interesting is it takes this um, evolutionary perspective on airline hijackings. Um, and by focusing on the tactic and zooming out, it's very informative about how airline hijackings evolved. So if you go back to the 1950s, 1960s, you had these competing sets of airline hijackings. There's something called freedom flights where people would hijack flights in uh, behind the Iron Curtain in communist countries and take them to the free West. Then you had uh, a corresponding set of flights where people in the United States started hijacking planes and flying them to Cuba and seeking to defect to Cuba. Um, so you had kind of these two different sets of airplane hijackings for political purposes. And going over previous literature on terrorism and airplane hijackings, a lot of those didn't show up. But by zooming out, not focusing on the actors, but focusing on the tactics, that book was able to show us a lot about airplane hijackings that weren't known before. Turning to 2020, you had four major mobilizations, all with very different causes, very different groups taking part. But I'd argue that each one learned something from those that preceded. The very first mobilization was an anti-lockdown mobilization. You then, after the murder of George Floyd, had a major national racial justice mobilization. There was a separate mobilization that came afterwards, an anarchist and anti-fascist mobilization, um, especially in the Pacific Northwest, uh, both Seattle, 
and Portland experienced this mobilization most strongly. Um, Portland, you still have um, a violence wracked city. And something that we saw in that mobilization was attacks on seats of government, attacks on the mayor's office for days and weeks and months on end. Then finally, you get to the Capitol Hill mobilization, the mobilization that came to a head on January the 6th of 2021. And each mobilization had something to learn from previous mobilizations. Um, this makes the point that I made at the outset when talking about how I viewed the Arab Spring, that there's the actor using a tactic today, but other actors will watch, other actors with very different views, and they will learn what they can and incorporate that which is useful. That's what we saw from 2020 to 2021, culminating in multiple aspects of the Capitol Hill mobilization that had learned from previous mobilizations. So I said I'd talk a little bit about uh, militant groups and um, I talked to you about my conversation with Matt and how I focused us a little bit away from groups specifically, but to me, Adam Wathen Division, which has gotten some notoriety lately and justifiably so, um, is very emblematic of the kinds of ways people could organize in the current information environment. Um, for example, in recent years, you had a cell in Florida of Adam Wathen Division, which acquired explosive materials. It may have been targeting a power grid or a nuclear plant. Uh, members of the group murdered a gay college student, a gay Jewish college student in California. There was an intimidation campaign targeting journalists and political figures that was broken up in Nevada. Adam Waffen is a neo-Nazi organization. It's also what's called an accelerationist organization. It believes that the best way to reach their objective is to hasten the collapse of the current order of government to, uh, you know, for them to uh, bring about a race war, a second civil war. It's more powerful, most likely, Adam Waffen as a virtual network than an in-person one. And I should specify, Adam Waffen Division has um, seemingly been renamed the National Socialist Order. Um, it sells, communicate, and propagandize online. And even that new name, National Socialist Order, was announced in the online space. It has somewhat of a leaderless model, um, which means that it doesn't have a singular outlook. And leaderless resistance also has a strategic purpose. It weakens authorities' attempts to disrupt the organization. That being said, even with this somewhat leaderless model, it's been sophisticated enough to organize paramilitary training camps in four different states. This is very much a 21st century organization that is designed and in fact enabled by the current information environment. As I mentioned, one other thing I wanted to talk about is, is mass shooters. We've had mass shooters increase significantly uh, globally in, in the United States. In 1997 to 98, you had 37 American lives lost in mass shootings. Two decades later, by 2017 to 18, that figure had risen exponentially to over 800 lives lost. Um, now, some of the uh, graphics here focus a little bit on um, mass shooters within the white supremacist movement, which as you can tell is a research area of mine. Um, but I wanna zoom out and, and talk about how there's a phenomenon that can be seen across movements. Um, so some of the, uh, the, the graphics at right were taken from um, some of our own online research. Uh, we can see iconography um, in the upper right-hand corner that uh, depicts Brenton Tarrant, who was the um, shooter in Christchurch, New Zealand, who killed um, over 50 worshipers at a couple of mosques. And also Dylan Roof, uh, who was the shooter at a black church in Charleston, South Carolina back in 2015. He claimed nine lives. In this particular corner of the internet, mass killers are lauded as saints. And you can see accompanying iconography. Um, Would-be killers or actual killers will post their manifestos in which they'll talk about their inspirations. And this is not limited to the white supremacist sphere. Um, there have been multiple shooters at schools who were um, influenced by the shootings in Columbine, Colorado that occurred um, you know, 22 years ago, almost to this day. 
April 20th of 1999. Um, and we haven't just seen Columbine killers, Columbine style killers in the United States. Even in recent years in Europe, you've seen would-be killers whose plots are explicitly um, influenced by Columbine. Again, this is a product of the information environment that we're in. In the pre-internet age, the Columbine killers or serial killers might be curiosities. They might sometimes be copied, but today it's not hard if you're fascinated by them to find others who are fascinated by them as well, who see them as heroes, who see them as models, who see them as something to be copied. And that brings us back to the capital attack. What was unique about the capital attack? Part of it is the mobilization was greater than authorities expected. If you look at preparations for the attack, uh, for, for what would happen on January 6th, there was plenty of chatter. People knew that something was planned for January the 6th. Uh, in DC, the mayor, Muriel Bowser, did call up the National Guard in advance, but only the DC National Guard in very small numbers and had them there only to direct traffic so that more Metro PD could be at the Capitol. It's very clear that they did not anticipate a mobilization of this size. Over a million people showed up from 40 states. 91% of them came from outside the Washington DC metro area. And basically law enforcement was overwhelmed. They weren't there in sufficient numbers. So there were tactics used to get in. Uh, one interesting tactic was a column formation in order to breach through law enforcement. Essentially in a column formation, you channel your power to a single point in the police line and are more easily able to break through. Uh, once protesters or rioters were able to get past the law enforcement cordon, they were able to fairly easily get into the, the building to scale the walls, to break windows, to, in order to gain entry. And at some point, uh, you know, the police on, on the perimeter, to some extent, gave up. They decided that they could form a more defensible perimeter inside the Capitol. There were hours during which the coordination of the National Guard was simply not going well. Um, and eventually reinforcements came in. But you know, for what happened at the Capitol, the end result, five killed, could easily have been much, much worse. So that so looking at where we are with building security, the takeaway point is this. What has changed? The information environment has changed. Whatever your cause, it's easier to mobilize people now quickly and in large numbers than it ever has been. Sometimes uh, trying to defend a perimeter is not even possible. Sometimes you're looking at what do we do once a perimeter is breached, but it pre presents a very different set of facts, a very different environment, and a very different, and I'd say thornier problem than if this were only a challenge of a certain set of actors. Uh, Matt, thank you again for um, giving me the opportunity to give this keynote. As I said, this is a really great panel and uh, it's an honor to be a part of it. And I'm looking forward to, um, with my fellow co-panelists, looking at some solutions here. Uh, thank you, David. God, that was so fascinating and interesting. And thank you for coming and joining us today. And I think I will pull you along to the panel discussion group as well. Um, just absolutely mind boggling how quickly um, technology assists now in the mobilization of large groups, David. It's just remarkable. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, yeah. So I know our panel would like to jump in here. And so without further ado, let me start introducing them. Um, first, Rachel Barr. She's a senior design engineer specializing in life safety products with Ambico doors and windows. Also, Khaled El Domiati, the principal engineer and vice president over at Stone Security Engineering. And finally, Mr. Mark Kirby a subject matter expert for critical infrastructure at Ameristar Perimeter Security. Welcome everyone. 
Let's see, we'll just give them a chance to get on camera here. There you are. Hi, guys. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's jump right into it. Um, Mark, we'll start with you. Um, you know, during that January 6 event, we witnessed temporary barriers and fencing literally dismantled or trampled on by rioters. And in some cases, unfortunate cases, being used as, as weapons against the police. On the other side of that, there's also been a lot of discussion and concern about what the perception is or the optics, if you will, on surrounding our, the headquarters of our nation, basically, uh, in Capitol razor wire. Um, so here's the question. If there is another mobilization in DC, what realistic countermeasures do you foresee and can they be more effective and appealing than just say chain link fence and barbed wire? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think with the intelligence that uh, can be gathered, that's going to set the precedence for what's going to happen. The so-called perimeter security that, that I saw in place is what we call the bicycle rack. And that's about as good as that is. Uh, those are barriers that can be picked up and used as they were as ramrods to uh, penetrate the windows and the doors of the Capitol and also push security forces out of the way, using it as a large bumper or a plow to move forward through the courses. Uh, there are available temporary security fences that can be rapidly deployed and they were deployed after the fact. Uh, with that concentric layer of security, if you will, comes the human factor, the security forces that then again can back up the fence or the security fence. So there were a couple things there that the, the Capitol was not prepared for what was happening. And when they get that many people lining up, you're just taking your chances that everything is going to stay peaceful, which it obviously didn't. And I believe a lot of people clamored within that, maybe not attempting to initially, but they were pulled in. Now, when you look at large facilities like that, there absolutely are fence systems that can be aesthetically pleasing and high security and they're used and we've built them around the country on high asset um, assets. So there is available these, uh, these fence systems that they're not chain link, they're heavier duty than chain link, they're anti-client, anti-cut systems that will keep people at bay and including intrusion detection systems and the human factor that goes along with that. But yes, they absolutely are available today and can be used and that just may be one of the answers for what we witnessed at the Capitol. Okay, and, and even in terms of what uh, David was talking about in terms of the rapid mobilizations that we're seeing occurring um, given our technology and our communication capabilities. So even with that short term time frame to set up and deploy these, these products, that, that too is reasonable and, and, and possible? Yes, absolutely. There can be housed at the Capitol, rapid deploys, security fence systems that can be implemented with equipment and workforces. And it can be set up very rapid. Um, that wasn't even a consideration at the time. I think the Capitol was just overwhelmed and they anticipated people peacefully demonstrating and that just wasn't the case. Okay, all right. All right, let's switch over. Um, Haled, uh, a few questions for you. Uh, from a design engineer's perspective, you know, how do you approach perimeter security and forced entry? And what are the specific challenges? And then sort of sub question to that, how do you prioritize them? Great question. Um, uh, thank, thank you all for setting up this uh, uh, seminar and webinar and uh, like to uh, thank everyone that attended it. Uh, so generally, if we look at it from a broader picture here, uh, probably addressing physical security protection implementation on uh, facilities, 
especially for high profile or iconic uh, historical facilities or, or facilities within the high uh, threat environment where you potentially have multiple threats. Uh, we look at it from a holistic approach, uh, in security design, assessment, and mitigation. And we really tie that with a layered uh, mitigation approach system of physical security mitigations. Uh, whether you incorporate physical uh, perimeter security, force entry, and or crowd control, ballistics, or glass, or others, you really want to do the a layered approach system, especially for some of these type of facilities, to come up with an effective outcome and be able to manage that with the operational training and maintenance resources that are available for that facility to run it more efficiently, especially with the emergency response plan. Uh, so the challenges that are in the industry and also with the practice in general uh, is when you're looking at some of these facilities, you wanna look at the balanced, balancing the act between security requirements and functionality and purpose of these buildings. Yep. You really want to have the desired outcome here that you don't want to take away from the purpose of the building or the facility, uh, especially with high profile buildings and, 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 uh, that are welcome to the public or have public access and so forth. So you, as you want to try to balance those acts, this is where sometimes you have to come up with creative solutions and some of uh, your creative ideas and mitigation systems like what Mark was highlighting, some creative uh, either uh, rapid deployment of temporary uh, barrier systems uh, for, for perimeter security uh, or others. Uh, some of the other challenges, especially when you're dealing with existing facilities or these high profile facilities, there are always going to be some structural uh, limitations, architectural, aesthetics, uh, the real estate, the space that to, to deploy or implement or uh, mm -hmm. Uh, there's also, especially with the high profile buildings, most of them also have historical requirements. So trying to even blend the historical requirements with security, <laughs> that by itself is like a debatable discussion. <laughs> Someone right. wants to keep the, the old glass uh, versus trying to mimic the look uh, uh, with, with something that looks similar to it. Uh, so you have to take all those into, uh, into into your consideration for balancing the, the mitigation approaches. Uh, for perimeter security, besides also looking also at the temporary uh, barrier solutions for rapid deployment for high risk, uh, there's a high risk uh, being uh, addressed. Right. Uh, uh, also, overall, the layering of a permanent solutions throughout these facilities can be implemented by blending some of the uh, landscape features with perimeter security, uh, surveillance and detection systems as well, but to use the terrain uh, and some of the natural barriers uh, integrated with physical barriers of others as needed. So that way you create a more balanced solution. Uh, and then obviously if that all fails and, and you know, the attack is right at the doorsteps of the building, uh, you wanna kind of have some what we call integration of some baseline, uh, potentially force entry or FEDR uh, or glass or others on your building facades, obviously being the windows and doors are your weakest elements. Uh, but you also have to take into account that the connections to your building framing, and the hardware operability, the maintenance ADA requirements, all that stuff. And Rachel can talk a lot more about that, especially with doors. But those are always going to be challenges you're going to have to address when you're trying to meet with, uh, especially with these type of buildings where there's high traffic and, uh, and also uh, all kinds of code requirements. Um, what we have seen in the industry also, sometimes we, we get on board late in the game. <laughs> and so it's pretty much you're designing, uh, security design in the vacuum, pretty much. There's not a, you know, proactive discussion with the design team, uh, with the uh, building uh, uh, operation users, and the uh, uh, and that kind of limits what the security design can come up with creative solution to address the uh, security threats uh, on these type of facilities. So, we really want to avoid that 
you know, design in a vacuum type of situation as much as possible. So, but it's really <laughs> important you guys come early to the party, not late to the party. So to absolutely. It, it, yeah. it just drives the, the approach to be very expensive, not practical, and potentially even they don't even integrate it at the point because they kind of give up. So right. bring the team at the beginning to kind of go through a risk assessment. Let's see what we can do with your allocated resources. And kind of also figure out, okay, do a cost benefit analysis. Like if, if I my threats for the day are this type of threats, but maybe I look at some elevated threats and I spend another extra 20% more now, <laughs> it right. might help me in the future. That's a big, big, big you know, it, it, it's just not the typical way of looking at designing because obviously for government contracting or even private contracting, try to develop a contract that opens to creative thinking and applications, uh, the language could be a little tough. <laughs> right. And that's an interesting point you make. And, and I saw a lot of heads nodding up and down kind of thing. Bring in, bring in the team early on, bring them in. Uh, you know, Absolutely. like I said, early to the party, not late to the party. That that seems to be a, a consensus point here. Yeah. And, and a lot of the uh, vendors out there and the contractors in this realm of the business, they're very actually smart, creative folks. I mean, because you really have to be creative. You have to test. You have to investigate to kind of develop practical solutions. But at the end of the day, whatever the current system solution, what you call off the shelf, maybe is kind of designed for specific threats, but has also specific applications, specific limitations. Uh, so sometimes with these existing facilities, you kind of want to have to open that creativity to come up with more practical solutions by doing some modifications in the existing designs or enhancement or even develop a new uh, approach. So that's, that's, that's per, generally the challenges we see in these type of uh, environments trying to come up with an effective solution for that. All right. Okay. All right. Kind of moving on a little bit um, to you, Rachel. Um, once the capital perimeter was breached, um, rioters really seemed to make short work of breaching the doors and the entryways to the building. Um, did anything stand out as surprising to you and what are the solutions available that can mitigate that kind of stuff in the future? Sure. Well, thank you, Matt, for having me here today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and it's a really interesting discussion. Um, so as you mentioned, once the capital perimeter was breached, um, the rioters really did make short work. It was a matter of seconds before they got through the doors and into the building. Um, it was very clear because of that, that these openings were not designed necessarily with security in mind and not designed to withstand this mob style of attack. Um, I mean, I found that shocking. I mean, yeah. it, it, it was like a matter of seconds. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. These, these openings clearly weren't designed to withstand any, any attack of this nature. Um, and considering that they weren't, it didn't surprise me that they got through so easily. There's a significant amount of thought and design that goes into um, designing openings that will protect against uh, attacks, whether they be mob style attacks, active shooter attacks. Um, so if you're not considering that in the de design stage, um, riders will get through pretty quickly. Um, and then to speak to your next point, um, what solutions are available? There are a number of test standards. There's a number of products available that speak towards forced entry um, and the product that's right for any given building or any given project will come down to a number of things. Um, one of those things uh, is, is budget. Um, one of those things is day-to-day -day functionality. Um, so these are some of the things that do need to be considered. There's some less demanding standards and solutions that focus more on robust hardware, access control, or retrofitting protective films on glazing that do provide a significant amount of protection. Um, looking more at new buildings um, or, or renovations on existing buildings, um, there's more robust solutions, heavy duty door panels, especially 
reinforced frames, glazing that's designed specifically to withstand ballistic and impact threats, um, and sophisticated hardware components. And all of those things really work together to provide that robust protection um, from a number of dangerous attacks, uh, including this mob style of attack that we saw January 6th. Right, right. And, and, and in a situation like that, I, I, I imagine that, it, it, again, the question arises about you know, functionality versus aesthetic. Um, you know, we don't want to have a big, giant, ugly steel door on our nation's capital. Um, but that said, in terms of door standards, um, I know there are 15 minute doors, there's 30 minute doors, there's 45 minute doors. Uh, how do you go about assessing what's necessary um, to a building like that? Yeah, so um, you're speaking, uh, sounds like probably towards the Department of State for Century Standard. And that's a standard um, that is used specifically to address these mob style of attacks. Um, and for this test method, uh, openings must go through rigorous concentrated assault tests um, with actual attackers, a large list of tools available, and the door and frame would need to withstand that attack for either five minutes, 15 minutes, um, 60 minutes are the more common ones. Um, and then there's also a ballistic component to that standard as well. Um, when understanding how long you want your door to withstand that attack, um, you can think about how long you anticipate until law enforcement might be able to intervene effectively, or in some cases anticipate how long it might take to move the people in the building within another area to safety. Um, and then you just wanna look at as well, um, what aesthetics need to be considered. Um, the, the more robust your opening is, the more structural it's going to look. Um, but as Kellen mentioned, and we see it all the time, it's really helpful to reach out early on in the design stages because just because your opening um, is robust and can withstand these types of attacks doesn't mean that it has to be a thick steel door that's really heavy, no glazing. Um, there are ways to incorporate aesthetics um, and still get that strength that you're looking for. There's recessed panels uh, for interior applications. You can take a steel door and sort of clad it with wood veneer. Um, and the earlier that manufacturers get involved that are familiar with this world, the better we can create a solution um, that will meet the needs of a project while still giving um, the strength that you need in case of an attack that we saw January 6th. Right. Right. I mean, if there's one takeaway from all of this, um, and this, you know, is kind of a general comment to all of you, if there's one takeaway for all of this, um, from my point of view, it's, it's really get design and engineers involved early on in, in the process. That's going to mitigate a lot of risk. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to turn back around and come back to you, David. Um, as you mentioned, you know, there's a lot of challenges given militant groups and, and how they organize and are organizing more quickly. Um, when it comes to prevention now, um, how can militant groups be better monitored or uh, watched over, I guess, um, in order to, you know, to prepare for such events or see events coming in the future? That's a great question. Um, now, if you talk to a lot of um, terrorism watchers or watchers of militant groups, they'll say, you know, we weren't surprised by this. Um, you know, we were monitoring chat of militant groups and we saw this night this was coming. I think that answer is actually not accurate. Um, like, I, you know, I watched these groups. I knew that many militant groups had something planned. Mm -hmm. But... What surprised people was not what militant groups were doing. It was the sheer number of people who turned out. Yeah. So a lot of things that make it difficult to understand numbers, I'd say the, the biggest factor is probably encryption. Uh, with end-to-end -end encryption, you know, one of the uh, legacies of the Edward Snowden revelations and many other things, uh, but with that boom in end-to-end -end encryption, it's harder to monitor, you know, overall 
um, the full volume of communications in preparation for an event like this. So I think probably the thing that would be necessary um, to kind of understand when you'll have a mobilization that could overwhelm people is basically um, probably using machine learning to understand volumes of social media chatter and what that means in terms of crowd size. Um, but I think it's very obvious and very fortunate that here the groups really didn't know what to do once they got inside. Even though there were militant groups who showed up who were planning to wreak havoc, you know, this is referred to as an insurrection. Um, and you know, it's technically an insurrection, and technically it was an armed insurrection. There were people who were armed, but you know, for an armed insurrection that breaches the Capitol and only five people die, that's not something with a whole lot of foresight and coordination among the groups. And I point that out because I actually find that to be somewhat chilling. I mean, given the psychological effect this has had, and you know, by you know, looking at every angle, the utter lack of coordination among the actors, I think that getting smart about um, understanding what crowd size is going to be, because crowd size gives a lot of opportunities for malicious actors to use the chaos of the moment to in some way strike. Yeah, and, and I wanna actually follow up with that because that it's a, it's a question I was gonna ask you later on, but you, you've touched on it now. And so I wanna kinda wanna get back to it. Can you expand a little bit? Because it, it's, it's not entirely clear to me. I don't know if it's entirely clear to anyone how it actually works. But again, you have these mass mobilizations of people then you have smaller organizations working within them um, with a very specific or very different agenda than, than the, the, the original uh, purpose of the mobilization. How, how does that work, um, David, in terms of, is there a level of communication there between the smaller group and the larger group? Or are they just kind of flying under the radar to, to uh, achieve their agenda? Well, both, um, it, you know, it, given that uh, the larger group is very diffuse and the smaller group is diffuse um, it, for all of these mobilizations. So one could think, for example, during the racial justice mobilizations, there are interesting, were interesting videos that came to light of like some anarchists there ready to like start breaking things and different you know, activists in the community saying, hey, you know, we live here don't you know, don't destroy our community that's a right. good example of where you have a smaller mobilization a militant anarchist mobilization that was part of a larger mobilization and members of the larger mobilization are saying hey no we don't we don't want you to do this here right. um, so that, that's kind of, that's an example of where they're cross purposes here um, you know it's very clear that the that for the January 6th mobilization the vast majority of people who showed up did not intend to mount an insurrection. Like that right. part is clear enough because it would have looked a lot different if you had a million people descend upon the Capitol all intent on attacking the Capitol. Um, so, you know, as to what the levels of coordination are, it's going to be, you know, somewhat similar to the example I gave in the racial justice protests. You'll have some people in the larger, um, in the larger mobilization who are supportive. You'll have some people in the larger mobilization who are not supportive. But then, you know, once the capital was breached, a lot of people went in for a lot of different reasons. Um, and one thing that that quite um, famously happened is you had um, you've had you had some left wing activists go in. Now, let's be clear: I'm not saying it was a false flag Antifa attack or anything like that. But some of them went in just because they were curious and were right. kind of documenting what was happening. So people went in for a lot of different reasons. But at any rate, larger mobilization, smaller mobilization, different degrees of communication some supportive and some antagonistic. Right. I mean, again, it, it always brings to mind and pops up to mind that the video that was, you know, on the news of, you know, the Capitol steps, crowds of people. And then very clearly on the right side of the screen, you saw this group of, I think, you know, 10 or 11 uh, guys in tactical gear, very organized, cutting their, their path through the crowd. Um, I mean, it, it just always reminded me of, uh, your answer reminded me of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th that part is interesting. Uh, and I'll, I'll make this very quick, but um, the what they were doing 
is generally used to reduce, um, you know, so it's used when breaching a building um, by rangers and others in infantry in order to reduce um, the amount of fire you might take. Um, here, I think the column formation was just used to really channel um, their force against the lion and to break the lion. Right. Um, so, yeah. Okay. All right. Look, um, we're going to spin around. We've got some audience questions here. Um, this one we're going to put out. Um, has anyone compared January 6th to the May Day 1971 somewhat peaceful protest in D.C.? Similar crowd quantities, certainly different communication tools. Um, David, why don't you start out with that? And then we have a couple other questions for the panelists. No, I mean, I don't know of, um, you know, studies that compare the two of them yet. It's still, we're still learning so much about the January 6th mobilization, um, but I would agree with the premise of the question. Um, similar size, very different mobilization tools and the difference in mobilization tools helped to produce a very different result. All right. It's interesting that the 1971 was quite a bit more peaceful too, I, in no uncertain terms. Okay, uh, next question from the audience, um, and this goes to the panel. Um, Mark, we'll start with you. Um, is perimeter security realistically possible given the enormous size of some of the government buildings and complexes that they're slated to guard? Absolutely. Uh, we have done huge perimeter securities around very high level institutions, uh, government, and yes, thousands of feet and sometimes in miles of feet and aesthetically pleasing powder coated and they can be integrated with uh, anti-climb anti-cut features and uh, vehicle barriers built right into the platform right okay uh rachel same question to you anything to add um no i just think that um you know, while you're building, even if your building hasn't been designed with these uh, security measures in place, um, there are ways to incorporate that, um, whether it be through hardware um, or through uh, protective films on blazing. Um, and then there's also ways to retrofit a building for those security measures um, that you know, speak to specific threats, could be active shooter threats, um, or could be these, these large scale attacks. Um, so it's definitely something um, that's possible to implement um, some really robust security measures um, without sacrificing uh, the look and feel of a building. Yeah, and retrofitting is far more commonplace now, I would imagine. Um, yeah, on, on historical buildings specifically, definitely retrofitting. Um, and we do see it a lot um, on schools um, and uh, churches, places of worship, um, where they might not have the budget to do anything uh, beyond, you know, put, put a robust hardware solution on an existing opening um, or put films on blazing. Okay. All right. Okay. And to you, Khaled, um, little bit of a hot seat question here, um, but uh, let's, uh, let's give it a try. On the January 6th event, anything, when you, when you look back on it, um, is there anything that's glaringly missing in your opinion or that you would have done differently from a uh, preparedness perspective? I mean, I know that's a, a, obviously a silly question, um, uh, I mean, it, it's, 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 I mean, what, what would you add or improve, I guess? In, yeah, we, in I, mean, that, I yeah. would say all of us were always, all of us were a bit surprised what would happen, especially this happening in the United of States. Of course, given, Just, given, 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 given. <laughs> yeah. So um, I want to, I want to, I want to frame this in a fair way too, sort of. Yeah. You know. But, but I think generally it's, it's the general approach as I discussed before is going forward with any, you know, high profile, like iconic or, historical facilities like similar to the Capitol or others. Uh, it's a similar approach we use for high threat environment facilities or uh, uh, embassy facilities and others, where you go through that kind of risk assessment approach and you come up with that layered physical mitigation. And that's what needs to be integrated. 
you're trying to identify what you're trying to prevent, what are the design challenges, and come up with the, the either you know off the shelf or creative customized solutions that uh, from operability and maintenance, and also from training perspective, uh, both for the security forces operating the building and also training the people that need to evacuate or, or, or shelter in. That that also it all ties together. So that's I think that's what I kind of maybe. The missing links here is to tie all that together in a holistic approach and coming up with that lit. If the other things fail and you really have, you know, you have to have physical mitigation through a layered approach to kind of at least delay as people go into and flood your building, either it's a mob attack or other. So from security perimeter features, as I discussed before, either temporary or permanent, uh, to baseline uh, physical mitigation measures that obviously we haven't seen it's, as we saw some of the weak points with the glazing of door systems on uh, some of the, like what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So you got to look into the uh, uh, that you know the threats, the risk, cost benefit analysis, and come up with a, with that layered approach because you don't need to as as, as Rachel was noted to like I don't I don't need to put that you know massive steel door uh, but if I want if I if I plan it in a way like I put the 15 minute or the or, or five I delay enough time so that the planning the, the response plan or evacuation or sheltering in is, is done effectively while delaying the, the right the, the crowds to, to flood into the building that could be that layered approach that we're talking about so integrating some force entry or person ballistics while also having proper planning through the and a design of FEBR also could be also fire maybe resistance for safe rooms or proper evacuation routes and proper response timing. That's what we would like to see moving forward for in terms of additions or improvements, uh, both from the planning perspective, design perspective, and implementation perspective. So. Right, right. Okay, interesting, interesting. All right. Um, one last question to you, David. Um, tell us what the future outlook is. Yeah. Are these types of attacks or mobilizations going to increase? Are they going to become more sophisticated in terms of, uh, are we looking at complex attacks coming up? Are uh, more armed attacks? What's, what's your view on the future? It's a wonderful question. Um, things tend to be cyclical, where we tend to project out, people tend to project out what they're seeing now as a trend that's going to continue at the same pace or maybe escalate a bit. But then you'll have intervening factors that, that produce a decline. So you know, as we get past the world of COVID, there may be less mobilizations as a whole. Um, you know, it could be that uh, the you know the government uh, cracks down significantly. We've already seen arrests related to January sixth. Examples could be made of some people. They could go after some organizations, and we again could see a decline in militant mobilizations. That being said, looking at the technologies, you have a few breakthroughs that are in process. One breakthrough relates to um, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones. Okay. Uh, drones. We've seen dro drone swarms used at some point in an offensive way, which provides a whole different threat vector because what we're talking about now, all of our preparation that we're talking about is coming from the ground. Right. See a threat vector coming from the sky at some point before too, before too long, before a decade, say. Um, but you know, I think in, in the short term, we're going to continue to see mobilizations across various groups, because right now, various groups with different agendas see mobilizations as successful. That puts us on a trajectory where we can expect this will happen again. And I think that you know, every, group, every militant group I've studied does after action review of events. And I think, as I talked about, the capital 
attack for the psychological damage it did is was just not that well prepared. It had no concept of what to do once the capital was breached. So I do right. think that the militant actors who were part of that mobilization consider, well, what do we do next? How do we take that next step? Uh, because looking at the four mobilizations I, I mentioned, we can see the, the January 6th mobilization as a little bit of an extension of the anarchist anti-fascist mobilization, just applied to a different target, not a mayor's office, not a police precinct, but applied to the Capitol building. There are other innovations that had to occur to apply it to the Capitol, but that's in part where I see the inspiration. And these groups tend to think through, well, what do we do next time? What's the innovation that we add? So I think that we're on a trajectory where this set of problems we're talking about is not going to go away anytime soon. It's very much worth thinking through the kind of um, you know, preparation, integrated into building design that Kali was talking about. Um, that is important for the time being. Uh, there are other trends that indicate other threat vectors. I talk about mass shooters. And in the few, you know, in the medium term, uh, perhaps we'll see the trend level off or maybe even reverse a bit. And in the longer term, we're going to see other new technologies play an interesting, important, and I'd say chilling role in future attacks. Yeah, I mean, you're when you when you bring drones into it, um, it just starts to make my head spin in terms of capability and 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 the ramifications of that as well. So, okay, um, everyone, this has been great, and um, I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, this concludes today's panel. On behalf of Protogetic and our sponsors, Ameristar Perimeter Security, Ambico Security Doors and Windows, and Clear Armor, Security Glass and Protective Coatings, I'd really like to thank you. Thank you for a truly informative uh, session. Mark Kirby, Khaled El Domiati, and Miss Rachel Barr, thank you very, very much. And Dr. Gartenstein Ross, David, thank you as well. If you have any questions, anyone, please go ahead and, and send them in or suggestions on a topic for the future. We'd love to hear from you at info at protogetic.com. And hopefully we'll be seeing you very soon um, as we host Dr. David Gartenstein Ross once again as we get into a more in-depth view on crisis architecture and rethinking the design of our buildings to prevent against mass shootings and, and other events. Um, that's about it for now. Everyone have a great day and thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh,